access to people and how Islam then uh, struck back in the Battle of Badr. Uh, and we also mentioned uh, that after Badr, uh, there's been uh, an increase in the animosity against Islam. Hatred against Islam has actually increased after the Battle of Badr. And there has been multiple groups now that targeted Islam as their main enemy. The first group, of course, was the pagans of Mecca. Uh, after they were defeated and wounded, and many of their noble people were killed in the Battle of Badr, their animosity and their hatred to Islam have only increased. The second group were uh, the Jewish tribes that lived in Medina and around Medina. The Jewish tribes now felt that their economic existence had been threatened by the newcomers of al-Muhajirin from Mecca who started having some active uh, an economical and uh, viable existence in Medina. And we know most of the people in Medina were not merchants. Most of the Arabs in Medina before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam were farmers. However, the newcomers, al-Muhajirin, the immigrants that came from Medina were all merchants. And the Jews uh, in Medina felt that they were threatened in their profession, that they had full domination uh, in Medina on. And another thing is uh, they also had a political situation where they always uh, would fuel the fire of, of a war between the, the main two tribes in Medina who are Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj. And uh, while they're fueling this, they, c they continue to dominate the political arena. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came, he canceled this animosity between Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj. He put the war down and he became the leader, uh, the de facto basically leader and the only ruler of Medina. And he put the Jewish tribes and the Arabs uh, of Medina, whether they were Muslims or non-Muslims, under a treaty that we studied a while back. The uh, other group that were uh, al-Munafiqun, and it's translated loosely as hypocrites, uh, but they're basically the ones that had to declare Islam. The, the, the pagans of Medina that did not embrace Islam initially after the migration of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but then later on after the battle of Badr when they saw the defeat of the pagans in Mecca and the rise of the Muslim army, they declared Islam and they hidden their uh, hatreds and their uh, disbelief in the religion. And the head of those people was a man called Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, and he, he will be mentioned many, many times in the next few sessions. The fourth group that also showed animosity and hatreds against Muslims were the Bedouins, the uh, Bedouins around Medina who used to make a living and they, the way of life was to invade Medina every now and then and take the loot, the spoils and, and flee out and then do this over and over again. And the people of Medina were busy in their own conflicts and in their internal war and they were not uh, uh, taking them seriously enough uh, where they would go chase after them or fight them. Uh, fearing that the other group, whether it's the Aus or Al-Khazraj, will take advantage of them chasing after those Bedouins and hit them uh, in their uh, homes. But now, after all of this changed, the Bedouins' felt, way of life felt threatened and they cannot do their invasion to Medina, so they also uh, hidden their animosity against Muslims. We discussed uh, today what happens with the uh, treaty between uh, the, the Jewish tribes and uh, Muslims in Medina. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a very well documented and very well thought treaty with the Jewish uh, tribes and with everybody in Medina uh, to protect uh, the Muslims in Medina and also to protect the rights of others that are lived in Medina. It was a mutual agreement of uh, def defending Medina against the external enemy and to not support external enemy against any of those uh, included in this treaty. And uh, 
the, the Jewish tribes in Medina after the Battle of Badr started getting anxious about the rising power of Islam and they started trying to get out of this treaty as much as they can. One of the events that happened and it's well documented uh, in history and it is narrated in Ibn Hisham uh, and it's also narrated in Ibn Ishaq. Uh, and it is a story of a Jewish uh, elder. His name was Shas Ibn Qais. And Shas was one of the uh, elders of uh, the Jews. And he, uh, as described Ibn Ishaq, he, uh, was, uh, ha he had extreme hatred against the Muslim existence in Medina. And he wanted nothing else but to expel Muslims out of Medina and to get things back to where they were before the trip, the journey of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam al Hijrah. So one day, Shas uh, was walking uh, a street of Medina, and he saw a group of Muslims sitting together, and on their faces there were smiles, and there were this uh, brotherhood and friendship, friendship between Muslims. And he looked at them, and there are men of them from Al Aws, and some of them were from Al Khazraj. And these are people that used to be sworn enemies to each other. They had blood, you know, they had killing against each other, they had wars against each other. They couldn't stand to, to see each other and hear about each other before this. And now here they are sitting the, together friendly, they're talking about hadith, they're talking about Quran, they have mutual interest, they look like one good family. And he did not like that. And, and the, what he said, and his uh, quote from uh, Ibn Ishaq, قَدْ اجْتَمَعَ مَلَأُ بَنِي قِيلَةَ بِهَذِهِ الْبِلَادِ لَا وَاللَّهِ مَا لَنَا مَعَهُمْ إِذَا اجْتَمَعَ مِلْؤُهُمْ بِهَا مِنْ قَرَارِ What he said basically is, Bani Qila, which is a derogatory uh, word that is used to describe Arabs, uh, then, and it's just basically the son, uh, means the sons of that woman, and it's, you know, uh, and they said, these these people, these, these Arabs, basically these Aus and Khazraj, are uniting in this land. And Wallahi, and he swears, that we cannot settle as a Jewish tribe in this Medina, we cannot control Medina, if they united, and if they get stronger together. How can we control them after this? So he asked one of his uh, people, and who was a young man, he said, Ahmed ilayhim, go to them, sit with them, and then talk about the day of Bu'af. We remember the day of Bu'af was a, a war that happened three years before Hijrah. And the killing and the victims of the day of Bu'af, which was a war between us and Khazad, were so many that people in Medina started looking for someone to come and actually do some peace between them. And then they found Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and narrated on Aisha that the day of Bu'af is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his prophet. And that was one of the immediate reasons why many, many people in Medina embraced Islam and embraced this Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who's an outsider to Medina to come and rule Medina and, and put peace in it. As much uh, killing and as much death that happened in the day of Ba'ath. So Shah said to this young man, go and mention the day of Ba'ath. Let them remember those who are killed. Let them remember their loved one that are lost on each side on the day of Ba'ath. And then start saying the poetry that preceded Ba'ath and that was after Ba'ath. So maybe they can get excited, maybe they can get, uh, remember that day and, and get their passion against uh, each other again. So the man sits there and he started talking about Ba'ath and he's, he was telling the Aus, do you remember how your poet said this about Al-Khazraj? And he would turn to the Khazraj and said, do you remember how your poet said this and this? And do you remember how your father was killed? Do you remember how your brother, this man killed, this man got? And people started getting memories there. And then one of them stood up and he said, I remember that type of poetry. And another man stood up and he started saying something that, yeah, we killed someone and we were the stronger par party in there. So he, they started having pride and they started remembering those days of ignorance 
where they were killing each other and they started uh, they started saying no, we're the victors and you're the, the losers and etc and then started they're getting louder and louder and they started then splitting into two groups and, and then one of them said well if you don't say that we are the winners then why don't we just do it again we will see who can win we, why don't we fight again and see who can be the winner and another person said well you're threatening us we're not going to fear this why don't we meet in such and such place and we'll get our weapons and we will see who is the winning tribe was it al aws or was it al khazraj so they ran to their houses and they started getting the swords and started getting the weapons and the shields and they had an appointment to meet each other and start killing each other subhanallah and then someone one of them ran to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Ya Rasulullah it's about to happen again Al Aws and Al Khazraj about to start killing each other again and then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became very angry and you can see the anger in his honorable face sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it's rarely seen but when he was angry all the companions all the sahaba knew when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was angry and he, he, he went out and he asked for, for all of these people to gather and he, he told them Ya ma'ashar al-Muslimin he did not call Ya ma'ashar al-Ansar or Ya ma'ashar al-Muhajireen or Ya ma'ashar al-Aws or Ya ma'ashar al-Khazraj the first word he reminded them of who they are Ya ma'ashar al-Muslimin oh you Muslims you're not Aws anymore you're not Khazraj anymore. You're not a, a patriot of Medina. You're not a patriot of Mecca anymore. You are a Muslim. You are one family. He said, Ya ma'ashar al-Muslimin. From the very first word, he basically solved the problem. Ya ma'ashar al-Muslimin. Allah, Allah. Allah, Allah. Just said that. Remind them. Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abi da'wa al-jahiliyya. Wa ana bayna adhurikum. You call for the way of ignorance. And I'm still among you, I'm still here, I'm still in existence, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you're calling for the way of ignorance, for the way of jahiliyyah. بَعْدَ أَنْ هَدَاكُمُ اللَّهُ لِلْإِسْلَامُ وَأَكْرَمَكُمْ بِهِ After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have dignified you and elevated you with Islam. Then you want to go back to that way of ignorance? وَاسْتَنْقَذَكُمْ بِهِ مِنَ الْكُفْرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has saved you gave you salvation from the disbelief, from the, 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 the way of idol worshipping, from al-kufr. وَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathered your hearts together. So now you want to do this? And people just listen to Rasulullah sallallahu wa sallam as if they're hearing this life for the first time. And their tears started coming out. Ya Rasulullah, forgive us. Ya Rasulullah, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. It is a shaitan that put that between us. And then started hugging each other and started kissing each other. And then Muslims that were about to get the swords out of their houses to kill their brothers, they started waking up and see the fact and see that what happened between them is nothing but a, a plot of a shaitan helped by this enemy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Shas bin Qais. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam resolved that conflict that way. Just two few words, two, you know, two lines of, of words that reminded Muslims who we are and, and what they're all about. And there's no Aus anymore, there is no Khazraj anymore. And of course, we also, as, as followers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and people on the same path, we, we take this lesson and we, we always have to concentrate on this fact that we are Muslims, four and foremost ones, and, and, and the one for all, this is this, this the truth of who we are. Doesn't matter who your father is. It doesn't matter what your color is. It doesn't matter what your tongue is. Doesn't matter where you were born or where you came from. It is the Muslim what get us together, and it is that brotherhood, that 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 bind, that bind that, uh, that bind us together. So, Shas ibn Qais was basically uh, defeated in his plot trying to put animosity back between Aus and Khazraj. But that did not stop them. The, the Jewish uh, merchants in Medina, they started trying to deal with the Muslim community and try to put some type of economic burden on them. So if a Muslim, if they, Muslim has 
taken a loan from them and they were merchants and they used to uh, give loans with interest, with riba, with usury. If a Muslim had a loan from them, then they wanted that loan immediately and they would started demanding, even if the loan is not due yet, they would still say, okay, well, since you became a Muslim, then this is a new rule. We, when we gave you the money, you are not a Muslim, but the situation has changed now. So we, have, we want our money back. And they started putting some uh, pressure on them. And if they had money from Muslims, they said, okay, well, you, we, we owe you nothing because we did not borrow this money from you. you uh, we borrowed the money from a person that used to worship such and such God, and now you change your God, so you have we, no money back. We, we're not going to give you your money back. So one way or the other, they would not give, they would not either give the money or take money from Muslims. And this was against the treaty. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had patience with them, had patience with them, and he did not start uh, enforcing this in, in, a, in a very forceful way. But, however, a tribe within Medina was called Banu Qaynuqa. We know that there were three major tribes in Medina, and we have to remember that because that's important in our study. Banu Qaynuqa, the people of Qaynuqa, they had their houses inside Medina. And they were the only Jews inside the, the limits of the city itself. There were another tribe called Banu Nadir, who had their houses outside Medina. And then another tribe, the third tribe was Banu Quraiva, and they had their houses on the eastern, southern front of Medina. And that would be very important, inshallah, we'll try to bring maps on the Battle of Al Khandaq, uh, the Battle of the Trench, because these people were in the back, they were the, the, the guards at the back uh, of the Muslim army. So, Banu Qaynuqa were the, the uh, tribe that actually lived within the limits of Medina. And they were the richest of the three tribes. And they had some. Uh, economical power where they had few professions that they had total monopoly over, like being goldsmith. They, they were the only ones that were goldsmith in, in Medina. They also were the smith in general, so they know how to make weapons. Uh, weapons were all made out of iron at that time, so they would make swords and spears and things like that. And they were like in control of gold, they were in control of ar the arms, basically the arms industry. And they also used to make other things that were made out of copper and iron, like uh, the uh, utensils and uh, the, the uh, dishes and other things that you use for daily living. They had a very profitable industry. And as we said, the people of Medina before Rasulullah were not industrial, and that was industry at that time. They were mostly farmers. And the people of Mecca were merchants. So Jews of Qaynuqa, they had really monopoly on industry in general, on the industrial power in Medina. They had 700 fighters, and as is narrated in Ibn Ishaq, they were the bravest of the Jewish fighters. After Badr, the people of Banu Qaynuqa started to uh, make some disturbances in Medina. They started to try to impose their power and boast with arrogance what they hold as far as uh, the, the control of these special industries. And they had their own market of the people of Qaynuqa. And any Muslim that would come to this market for one thing or the other, they would harm him, either cheat him when they're selling him something or when they're buying something out of that Muslim. And then their uh, rudeness and, and their transgression got to the Muslim women that used to go to the market. And they started harassing the Muslim women coming to the market for buying gold, jewelry, or other things, utensils that they used in their daily living. Rasulullah got the news that Banu Qaynuqa is behaving that way. So he had a treaty with them. So Rasulullah 
being the fair prophet وسلم, that he is and the human being that we know he is he gathered them he said Banu Qaynuqa I need to have a word with you so he gathered the people of Qaynuqa and he said Ya Ma'ashara Yahud O people of the Jews Qaynuqa Aslimu first he called upon them to accept Islam that's his mission in life Rasulullah is a messenger of Allah whenever he sees anybody the first thing that he will do is what? to invite him to accept the message that he was sent for he said Aslimu accept Islam قبل أن يصيبكم مثل ما أصاب قريشا before what happened to Quraysh in Badr those people who are killed who insisted on fighting insisting on being arrogant insisting on, on uh, making Muslims their enemies see what happened to them accept Islam before some catastrophe like this hits you so what was the way they replied to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi said Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam لا يغرنك من نفسك أنك قتلت نثرا من قريش كانوا أغمارا لا يعرفون القتال Don't feel like since you killed few people of Quraysh who did not even know how to fight in the first place that you actually is a good fighter. Don't think that you are a good leader, a good fighter just because you killed this few of Quraysh. إنك لو قاتلتنا but if you fight us, if you think that you're gonna, you're threatening us with Quraysh, you're telling us that if you don't accept Islam, something will happen to you. But if you fight us, you will know what kind of fighters we are. You will know who are the real fighters. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, revealed in, in, in a Quran for this. He said the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't answer them back, I will answer them back. See what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Al-Imran, verses 12 and 13. Say to those who rejected, kuffar, they rejected the call. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Aslimu, come to Islam. They rejected. Satughlabun, you will be defeated. You think you will not be, you will be defeated. Satughlabun, wa tuhsharuna ila jahannam. And after you defeat it, you will be led to Jahannam. And it's a worst place to dwell. You had an example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is continuing from Al Imran, talking to the Jews. That you had, a, you had an example before you of two groups that fought each other, meaning the battle of Badr. The first group fighting in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأُخْرَى كَافِرَةً And another group was kafira, was kuffar, was rejectors, disbelievers. يَرَوْنَهُمْ مِثْلَيْهِمْ رَأْيَ الْعَيْنِ They see that they are twice as many as they are. Like they see each other. They see it very truthfully. وَاللَّهُ يُؤَيِّدُ بِنَصْرِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah indeed sends his victory and his support to whomever he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pleases. Inna fi dhalika la ibra. Indeed, in, there, in that similitude, there is a lesson. Li'ulil absar. For those who see, for those who contemplate, those who understand what is before them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them, don't threaten my messenger. Don't threaten my prophet that if he fought against you, then he will be defeated and you are the real fighters you will be defeated and then you will be taken to Jahannam and then that's how you take that lesson that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has given you and you reject it and the way they answered Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is nothing short of declaration of war Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called upon them to respect the treaty said we have an agreement and I heard that you're doing such and such and such and such and that's not what we have agreed upon. Then I'm calling upon you to respect the treaty that we had. It's a constitution basically of Medina at that time. So the Jews when they said, no, you fight us and you will see what kind of fighters we are, they're basically saying, no, we will not respect the treaty. And it's basically a declaration of war against Muslims. And then another event happened that was the last straw that basically broke the camel's back. It was the last thing that Muslims could take from this aggression, 
from this denying of their basic rights and the rejection of the treaty that was between them and, and the people of Qaynuqa. A woman, a Muslim woman went to the market, to the Jewish market, and she uh, sold uh, some goods that she had, and then she went to a goldsmith to buy jewelry with the money that she got for what she had sold. So she sat in, in that jewelry store with the goldsmith, who was uh, naturally a Jewish uh, goldsmith, and then they started harassing her and asking her to show her face, to show her arms, to show her beauty, because she had cover. And she would not do that, and she would tolerate them. So one of them, while she is busy uh, with, the, with the goldsmith, he took her dress, and he hooked it in a way to her seat where she get up, then her dress would fall. And it happened, and she was exposed in front of the uh, Jews in that market. And they started laughing and started enjoying the scene, and, and it was a major embarrassment to this Muslim woman, Muslim sister. A man who happened to be around that market at that time was a Muslim, and he saw that scene, and he couldn't take it, he couldn't tolerate it. So he ran to that goldsmith and he killed him. And then the people, the Jews that were around the goldsmith, they attacked the Muslim and killed that Muslim for defending, for trying to defend the honor of uh, his Muslim sister. So now there's blood. Now it's not only harassment, they're killed, the people killed, and the harassment got so rude that it cannot be tolerated anymore. And that is it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had had it with this transgression of Bani Qaynuqa. So he appointed a leader on Medina to govern Medina while he's busy in taking care of the people of Bani Qaynuqa. And that uh, man was Abu Lubaba. Uh, may Allah be pleased with him. And then he took, he, he took the banner of war. So now it is basically a declared war to restore the treaty and to restore the Muslim honor. The treaty is basically gone between them and Qaynuqa, but now it's to restore Muslim honor that's been uh, attacked in the market. So he gave the banner to Hamza, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, his uncle. May Allah be pleased with him as well. And then he walked with an army to the uh, place where the people of Qaynuqa lived. When they saw the army, all that uh, challenging of Muhammad come to us we will fight you will show you what kind of fighters we are they ran into their fortresses they closed their doors and they stayed inside and not one of them would dare to go up and out and face the Muslim army and that was in Shawwal in the month of Shawwal in the middle of Shawwal and it was a uh, Saturday on the second year and that's if, if you don't just you know Ramadan Shawwal so uh, Badr was when? The 17th of Ramadan. And then this is the middle of Shawwal. It's not only a month, barely a month after the Battle of Badr when this has happened. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam put a camp around their houses and he besieged the houses of Qaynuqa for 15 days. And during this 15 days, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the fear inside the hearts of Bani Qaynuqa and they surrendered. They surrendered everything to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to the Muslim army. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ordered that they would all be jailed and chained until he decides what to do with the treason and with this uh, things, with all this aggression that he, uh, that he tolerated from them. Then the hypocrite comes. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul was from Al-Khazraj, a tribe of Al-Khazraj. And Al-Khazraj and Banu Qaynuqa were allies before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to Medina. So he was the head of Khazraj and those were his old allies, the Bani Qaynuqa. And now they are prisoners under the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Ya Muhammad, ahsan fi mawali, be good to my allies, Ya Muhammad. See, how a Muslim 
would talk to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like this. I mean, in, in such a rude manner. I mean, we know people, Muslims never call Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Muhammad. They address him, Ya Rasulullah, Prophet of Allah, or Messenger of Allah. He said, Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ahsan ila mawali, be good to my allies. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turns away from him. He doesn't deal with him. Then this man goes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and grabs him. And he grabs him with his shield. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam still had the dress of war on him. And he grabs him and he holds him next to his body. He said, Ya Muhammad. And he shakes Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ahsan ila mawali. Be good to my allies. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the narrator of, of this hadith said that we saw the anger in the, in the eyes of Rasul, in the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Arsini, let me go. He's talking to Abdullah who's supposed to be basically a servant in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Abdullah insisted on his position. He said, La wallahi la wasalak. No wallahi, I will not let you go until you be good to my allies. To, be, to Bani Qaynaqa. There are 400, they had 700 fighters. We, we know that they had seven, their army was 700 fighting men. He said, 400 of them that have no shields and 300 of them that are shielded, that's full army. And they protected me. They were the ones that used to protect me. And they would still protect me. How would you kill them all in one day? Would you just wipe this, this whole army out in one day? I'm afraid that if you kill them, then I would have no protection. <laughs> Subhanallah, aren't you a Muslim? Aren't you taking protection in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger and this Muslim community and this Muslim Ummah? No, He said, these are my allies. My allies are not those Muslims. My allies are those the people of Qaynuqa. You be good to my allies. So I would continue to be good to you. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had utmost patience with this enemy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we will see the way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam treated this man. Wallahi, the patience. And how much Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was able to deal with this man, Abdullah. No one, no one can ever imagine the extent of the, the patience and, and this mercy that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had with him until the day he died. So he said, okay. I will be good to your allies. So he gave them a deal where it, if Rasulullah will let them go, will not kill them, will not basically their, their, their really their justice punishment would be execution. These are people who had a treaty and the treaty was clear and if they break it they should be killed. But Rasulullah said I will let them go on one condition. They will leave their weapons and they will leave Medina. They will leave the entire city of Medina and they will just be expelled. He exiled the entire tribe of Qaynuqa. So they uh, accepted that and they left and they went north to the borders of Asham, south of Jordan right now. And that's where they settled until they, uh, the history basically uh, said that they were basically gone. They, they, they'd gone in, uh, all over the, the world. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took their money and took the spoils that he gathered from this battle, which is called actually, there is no actual fighting in this, but it's called Ghazwa to Bani Qaynuqa. It's called the, the Ghazwa, and we know the Ghazwa is when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in the army in Sariya, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not in the army. And this, this Ghazwa of Bani Qaynuqa, he took the spoils and he divided it such as if there was fighting among the army, and he took the fifth. And with that fifth, that was also brought back uh, to the Muslim army. Uh, and again, that was about a month after the Battle of Badr. And now inside the, board, the city of Medina itself, there was mostly Muslims that lived there, and there was no uh, Jewish tribe after that uh, Ghazwa. <coughs> Another event that was important that also happened in that uh, interim between uh, Badr and Uhud was uh, a ghazwa, another ghazwa called Ghazwa to Suwayq, a Suwayq. And a Suwayq basically 
is when you have the branch of the, the palm that had the dates on it. And I don't know if, if many of you have seen that, but it's uh, mostly now common in, in uh, Saudi Arabia and Iraq that you can s buy the dates while it's on its branch and it's preserved that way. So they used to uh, keep the, the dates on their branch when it's uh, after it's harvested and they would just keep it dry that way. And when you eat it, you just take the branch and, and then after that, subhanAllah, it started getting rotten only after you take it off the branch. So anyway, the date on their branch, they called a swipe and they used to keep that as a supply. And they would take it with them on their travels, on their wars, or whatever to, to be fed from. So we'll see the story of this ghazwa and why was it called ghazwa to suwaiq. But I just wanted to explain what, the, what this suwaiq was. It was not a place, it's the, it's the dates, it's the food. Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, the one that led the caravan to safety at the day of Badr, uh, and he lost so many uh, of his friends on that day of Badr, he had vowed that he will not wash himself and he will not touch his wives unless he goes and attack Muslims in their own hometown. So he had a vow and he was declared, he declared this, so now, you know, he basically deprived himself from a lot of things and he felt the pressure that he need to basically fulfill what he had promised himself and he, he should fulfill his vow. So he took 200 fighters and 200 camels and he wanted to go and invade Muslims in Medina. He just wanted, he didn't take a, a huge army for different reasons. Number one, he wasn't really serious about going in there and trying to really have a real battle. He wanted basically to fulfill his vow and keep the dignity of Quraysh among the Arabs. It's like, listen, we were not completely defeated, we're still here, and here's why we're going to just go in and invade them right in Medina. So he wanted just to do a hit and run type of an invasion. So he uh, got close to Medina with these 200 that were just basically left Mecca in the dark of secrecy, and they camped outside Medina and nobody knew who they were. So at night he uh, goes to the Jews to uh, get uh, some allies and to get some help on this mission that he came to Medina with. So he went to uh, Huyay ibn Akhtab in Quraiza and Huyay closed his doors and he did not receive him. He said, I have a treaty and I have no interest in, in doing this with you Abu Sufyan. So Abu Sufyan goes to the other tribe, Banu al-Madir, and he goes to their leader, Salam, Ibn Mishkam. So Salam uh, actually received Abu Sufyan and he gave him food and wine and he had dinner with him that night. And he started telling him where Muslims are, where their army is, how they're doing after the battle, where they're hiding, all the news about all the intelligence. He was basically the mole, the spy that told Abu Sufyan about the Islamic Muslims and their preparation and their preparedness for war. So he can invade at the right time and the right place. So Abu Sufyan, after he got the news from this uh, traitor basically, because again Salam had a treaty with Rasulullah that they will defend him against an invasion if it happens. See what they're doing is they're actually aiding the invasion with intelligence and telling them where to strike and how to strike. So Abu Sufyan took that intelligence, took that information from Salam ibn Mishkan, and then he goes into a place called al arid which is a, a suburb of Medina, and he goes in there and he knows that there was some thing that he could capture, some spoil like camels and harvest that was ready to be captured based on the information that he got from Salam. And he saw only two Muslims in there, two basically two peasants, two farmers, that were working in their field in that area, so they kill them. So they kill them and they take the, the camels and they take the horses and they take the harvest and they started running. It's all they wanted. They really did not want to invade Medina. They just wanted to prove a point that was still here and still can attack. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa heard about the attack so immediately jumped on his horse and started chasing 
after the Abu Sufyan army and the Sahaba started running just to, to their weapons and to their swords and they started ch chasing after Abu Sufyan and his people. So Abu Sufyan boasting and getting this uh, loot and the spoils and he invaded Muhammad وسلم, in his own house and his own home of Medina and he looks behind him and he sees the dust of the riders, the horse riders just coming after him fast and he started running with his 200 people. So they started running but they had all these spoils with them so they started throwing the spoils off the backs of the horses so they can be light enough to run away. After they put the spoils back on and, and they ran, they still felt like they cannot escape. The Prophet and, and Sahaba are still chasing after them. So they started throwing their own dates, the swaiq, the, the, the food that they had with them on their journey. They started throwing that. So throw, they threw everything so they became very, very light and they actually escaped from the Muslim chase, from the posse that was after them. So instead of Muslims losing spoils on that one, they actually gained this wayq. They gained the date that the, the, the Mushrik army, the pagan army had with them coming to invade. So they took that wayq and they divided among them as their own loot from that battle. And that's why that battle was called Ghazwat al -Suwayq. It's the battle that the Muslims actually were invaded in Medina, but they chased after their enemy and they actually gained from their enemy what their enemy had to throw away, not to face the Muslim uh, chasers. And this, uh, this uh, uh, Ghazwa, this battle happened in Dhul Hijjah, in the month of Dhul Hijjah on the second year of Hijrah, two months after the battle of Badr, two months after the battle of Badr. See the life of Muslims, you will see how Subhanallah, we, we learn from the permission of jihad, of fighting in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how almost every month there was either one or two battles, one or two sariyah, one or two ghazwa. It's like a continuous, continuous struggle their life. I mean, Badr is only two months and this is the third battle already that they are going through after, after Badr. In Al-Muharram, Immediately the month after that, the first month of the third year of Hijrah, there was another ghazwa. There was another ghazwa. And this ghazwa called ghazwa to the Amr. The Amr is the place, is the name of a place. It's a well. It's a place of water. And it's called the Amr. And the story of this uh, ghazwa, which happened one month after ghazwa to uh, just a continuous uh, legend and legacy of, of, of fighting in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that gathering of the, the tribe of Thalaba and the tribe of Muharib, which are the large Arab uh, clans and tribes around the Medina, that they are gathering, they want to invade Medina, like their way of life. They, we remember we said that there are four groups that are enemies of Islam and one of them were the tribes, the non-Muslim tribes and the clans around Medina. And the two of them gathered together and they wanted to invade Medina. Uh, got from his own intelligence agency that there is a war, there is an invasion coming and he had the news that these two tribes are preparing to invade him in Medina. And we know the motto of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that مَا غُزِيَ قَوْمٌ فِي أَقْرِ دَارِهِمْ إِلَّا ذَلُّوا That people would be indignified if they let an invasion come close to them and they're not out to fight it. So he always, when he knows that there is something that is coming to Medina to uh, threaten the, basically the civilian life of Medina, he would always prefer to actually go out and, 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 and face that invasion outside Medina, with some exceptions that we will uh, study inshallah later on. But that was the, the, the rule and there were some exceptions like the Battle of Ahad and the Battle of Al-Khandaq. So anyway, he uh, gave the government of Medina under Uthman, Ibn Affan, may Allah be pleased with him, and he took 450 fighters, which is almost, I mean it's almost time and a half what he had in the Battle of Badr. He took a bigger, big army and he went out to the uh, place of Bani Thalaba and Muharib. 
And on the way, he found a scout from the people of Bani Thalaba. His name was Jabbar. And he captured him as prisoner. And then Jabbar uh, basically uh, embraced Islam after he saw the way of the, the life, the, prison, uh, the war and, and the army and how they are obedient, their, their cleanliness, their behavior. Their, uh, this is the best way of calling for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to actually behave like a Muslim. And when he saw this, he instead of becoming an invader or, uh, or an enemy to Islam, he basically immediately embraced Islam. And then he started telling Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the army and the people of Thalaba and what they're preparing and what they're hiding. And he said, just gave him all the information, subhanAllah, that he needed. So uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa asked Bilal to take care of uh, the new Muslim Jabbar and to make him his brother. So Bilal started teaching Jabbar the the uh, teaching the, the deen of Islam. And they continue on with their uh, march to uh, the people of Thalaba. So the people that were preparing the invasion against Medina got surprised with instead of now they attack uh, and they take the element of surprise against Muslims in Medina, they themselves were surprised with this army of Medina coming to them. So the fear just settled in them and they started fleeing from their own houses, from their own tents, from their own places to the mountains. And they left everything behind them and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam captured uh, whatever he could capture and they, he stayed in the place of the Amr. And when we mentioned that many times before in many of these invasions in Ghazwa that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when he goes to a place, he stays there. And that's what happened in Badr basically then the army of Quraysh wanted to stay there and wanted to fight. It's basically a challenge that we are here. If you want to fight, come and fight. He waited the entire month of Safar. The entire month of Safar and nobody came. Nobody, none of these brave invaders came to attack the Muslim army or fight them. But what that basically did is gave a lot of power to the Muslim army and a lot of power to the Muslim state that you don't just decide to invade us, you will be attacked, you will be attacked in your own home and then if you dare, come and fight.